So why are people, even humanists, not immune to racial bias? Why do you want to know about racial bias? Why do you need to know about it? I mean, why assume that humanists would get a pass on this? And the reason you assume this is because everyone in this room is a critical thinker. I mean, you go out of your way to get into groups to talk about critical thinking, right? I mean, there's no group of people who's more critical thinking than the people here. And you come from all different backgrounds as far as your education and stuff, and you can contribute different things and think critically a lot, okay? And that's great. Critical thinking, what is that? What is critical thinking? It's, it, it's because we're enlightened in this way. I mean, enlightenment about how to think about things, using the scientific method. You know, that, this all goes back a few hundred years, right? Francis Bacon and other, and other philosophers of the 17th and 18th century figured out we don't have to do what we've been doing. We can, have, we can think of new ways of addressing problems, new ways of thinking about nature and life, and new ways to explain things, okay? I can't imagine why that would cause a bias. Hmm. And for those who really want to know, those that are, that's who we got there up there, Voltaire, Bacon, Descartes, et cetera. Um, here's one of the slides that's screwed up. This shouldn't be happening right now. Okay. Um, so Eventually, I'm going to convince you of something, maybe, or you're going to just think I'm wrong, that that whole thing with critical thinking and enlightenment thinking is actually kind of a fake thing. When they invented a scientific method that didn't cause people to start using it instead of the other thing they were already doing in their heads, when they started thinking of things like the deductive, hypothetical deductive method and using certain kinds of inference that are logical, when they thought of that stuff, it's great stuff. They figured out how to do it, that's fantastic. Even things like statistical inference, when they thought of all that stuff, it didn't change our brains to start using it. We only use those things as tools. When we think of it, we force ourselves to use those things, but that's not how you actually think, okay? You think the way that our ancestors 50,000 years ago thought, and 30,000 years ago, and 40,000 years ago, we, 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 our species may have changed the way it thinks a little bit, but we have a way of thinking that, that comes to us prior to Francis Bacon, and Francis Bacon didn't get rid of it, okay? And the ultimate simple version of the conclusion I'm gonna lead you to is that the way we actually think makes racial bias work. Racial biases are not a bug, they're a feature. A bad one. It's like driving. Driving down the street, you see someone drive down the street and they're on the wrong side of the road. They don't stop at a stop sign, they're going too fast. That's driving. You can't say that's not driving. When you're driving the speed limit, that's driving. When you stop at a stop sign, that's driving. But all the bad stuff, that's not driving. No, that's also driving, okay? Racial biases and all those things are part of the way we think all the time. It's part of the way we learn all the time. It's part of the way we communicate all the time. Okay. Having said that, I quickly add that it is a falsehood to believe that racism is automatically present in all human cultures. You know how all human cultures have a flood myth? They don't. <laughs> all human cultures probably have a fried bread, but they don't have a, 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 a flood myth. That's a myth. All human cultures don't have what you would identify as racism. All human cultures have assholes. All human cultures have people who might be out for something that can create a racist situation. But American racism is really unique, and it works a certain way, and you're gonna find racism in other, I'm not saying other cultures don't have it, I'm just saying don't assume that your understanding of racism from your society and culture informs you of the human condition. It doesn't, it informs you of your condition and your immediate society. And broadly among humans, it isn't applicable. It's not a human universal. Being hateful and being racist is capable, all human groups are capable of it. But when, they, when researchers do things, they say, well, there's the out-group, in-group thing. I lived with other people in other cultures, and I, never, I would never have come up with the out-group, in-group thing the way that we think of it in this country. People definitely recognize people are in different groups, but, but the out-group, in-group thing that we see in, conceptualized by American psychologists and American researchers in this is not what you see universally, okay? Um, so where does our racist behavior come from? our racist behavior here in this room, here in this city, here in this country, 
Okay? How does it affect the victims? And I don't mean about the bad stuff that happens. That we know about. I'm talking about how does it actually, is it mediated? Like you can have all the racist thoughts in the world, but if you keep them to yourself, maybe it doesn't matter. But there are things you do that do matter, or we all do that do matter. How does that work? And it turns out, in my view, the answer to those questions is the same as the answer to the question of what makes us human. Okay? Um, racial biases, even really subtle ones, are really good at ruining people or oppressing people because they are part of how we are selected and, and shaped by our culture and our evolutionary history to be really good at certain things. And racial biases fit into that category. Okay? It's, like, it's like a really, we have a very sharp sword that we use for other things, and it can also be used for this. And so the tools we use to shape the minds of our growing offspring and among adults are really powerful, but also they're so effective and so ingrained that quite often they're just very subtle and you don't even know that they're there. Okay. Um, I also want to just say, as a matter of course, that the brain may be a lot like a computer. And when I teach about neurobiology and I do talks on brains and stuff, um, there's a million ways, not a million, there's five or six really good ways in which a brain is like a computer. You know, if you know about computers, they have a processor with a clock, not like a clock on the wall, but like everything's time. Boom, boom, boom. You buy a computer that's 322 megahertz. Brain has that. You have short-term and long-term memory in your computer. Brain has that. Lots of stuff in the brain is like a computer, but, but a brain is not built like a computer is built. And you can't look at a person's behavior and reverse engineer what's going on in the brain because that brain initially came from neurons that evolved to operate a certain way in some kind of worm thing. Our brain, our, our being, our mind as humans is something that is not a simple extension of a mammalian brain or a vertebrate brain or an animal brain. It includes those things. Our emotions, our emotional mechanisms are similar across mammals. So we might expect to see some emotional things that are similar, but they actually vary a lot too. But what our brain is, the part that we think about as our mind, the part that's doing the racist things, it doesn't exist in other animals. Okay. Um, if you get a chimpanzee at birth and you raise it in a fully linguistic environment, it'll become slightly linguistic, like a human. And if you really want to push it, you can make it very impressive looking. It's not going to be a human. Okay. Uh, we only, only humans have that. And, okay. One way we can see how hard it is to reverse engineer the brain is when things are oddly broken in the brain. These are two classic, well, one classic example and another personal example. Classic example is if you have a corpus colossum, your corpus colossum cuts, so your two sides of your brain are severed. You all learned this in psychology class in high school. Um, weird things happen. So if you happen to be, if you happen to be um, doing all your linguistic functioning in your left hemisphere, which not all people do, but if you do, then your, your right eye, which is connected to your left side of your brain, can see a word and you can get the word. But your left eye doesn't. So if there's a, a, a shield and the person can see the words key ring and the speech is at your left side, they will um, not perceive the word key. Um, that's that's just a very simple example of what can happen when a brain is somewhat broken. Um, why would your brain be lateralized? Why would language work the way it does when you break things in the brain, things break in weird ways linguistically, that they wouldn't break that way if you engineered a brain from the ground up to be a linguistic machine? Uh, the one on the right is a similar case. Uh, somebody, I, my sister's friend, had a brain tumor, and he, before he died, it was getting kind of bad, and he would eat half the food on his plate. He didn't have a concept of having, this is not a linguistic act. Seeing spaghetti on your plate is not an act of linguistics, okay? But he couldn't perceive the food on one side of his plate. So his wife would just turn the plate around and he'd eat the other half, okay? So it, there's countless examples of weird things that happen when brains break. And I mean, I was talking to a, a, a muscle scientist last night about this. We knew that, we knew that muscles contracted, okay? Uh-uh, they don't contract. What happens is the fibers slide over each other, right? You all learned that in basic high school. Biology. Uh -uh. If they were sliding over each other, there'd be little mechanisms that are also sliding over each other. That's not how it works at the microscopic level. The way it works at the, at the fine level of the, of the actin and, and myosin arms is that a certain part of the myosin head becomes either more or less organized. And a, a pro procedure, that, a, 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 an effect you can only see using electron spin resonance by looking at a certain electron attached to one of those molecules. 
So, at, so when I go like this, what's happening is my, my myosin heads are becoming more or less organized. Who would have thought that, right? But as you go from the surface down, you don't see, you can't predict what's going to happen. And also, we got screwed up by these guys. And they talk about this is a rationalist community, so we all worship certain great, not worship, I know, you know. But like, Carl Sagan's great, right? Neil deGrasse Christ, you know, he's got some problems lately, but he's great, okay? Um, I could have put Bill Nye up here. But one of the things that they kept saying, Sagan talked about the billions and billions and billions and billions of ya, 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 whatever. And we are only a tiny speck. We are irrelevant. It was David Attenborough who said, I think, if, you, if aliens arrived on the Earth, they would see nothing but forests and grasslands. After they hung around for a few months, they might bump into the humans. They'd be busy looking at the insects. These are all things to say to make humans feel small. And we need to make humans feel small because humans need more humility. But they're untrue. I used to fly over Libya at night a lot. And it was always fire, 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 fire. For two hours, you're flying over it. There's fire everywhere. Okay? A third of the fire was oil wells ignited. Two thirds of the fire is grassland fires lit by humans. If I'm an alien arriving, I see fire everywhere. I'm going to go check it out what it is. If I'm an alien observing Earth, I'm going to notice changes in the atmosphere. The chemistry of the atmosphere is changing. What's causing that? Turns out that that's humans changing our, our atmosphere. Humans will be discovered instantly by aliens coming here. We're a really big deal, okay? And we're really different from other animals in the way that our mind works. We have a mind, they don't have one. And it's just easy to, to not realize that or to think that's heresy to say because it doesn't fit with the paradigm of our smallness in relation to the universe. Now, I'm perfectly willing to accept that some alien species will come along and their neurons evolve differently and they're like way smarter than us and I will welcome our overlords. But until that happens, Neil deGrasse Tyson is wrong. They're wrong. We are really special and we can tell because we're ruining everything so fast and our minds don't work like other animals. We can't take the hominicule of the Middle Ages. You know, in the old days it was thought that humans were a little tiny miniature person inside a sperm, females being vesicles. And the sperm then grows from a little tiny miniature human into an adult full human um, you can't look at a car and know whether or not the inside of the car is being run by an engine, run by a motor, electric motor, or a gasoline engine, or a hamster. In this case, it's a hamster. Okay. Um, so we have this very basic concept that we are taught in schools, and if you don't believe this, you're not thinking scientifically. Have you ever heard anyone say that to you? Usually the next thing is some racist comment or some anti-climate context, or usually it's a pro-nuclear comment sometimes. If you don't believe what I'm about to say, you're not thinking scientifically. And what we know happens is that there are genes that are expressed that make bodies, and then bodies are under natural selection, and then that feeds back into the genes, and that's, that's evolution. And if you don't explain things that way, if you don't understand things that way, then you're not thinking scientifically, okay? And of course, that's not true. Scientists don't think that. But that's the kind of surface version of science we all get and then glom onto as people who want to be rational thinkers, but we do other things in our lives besides evolutionary biology. You know, there are genes that are expressed, whether, whether or not a gene, gene is expressed can be shaped by the environment it's in. What it does, what the product does, can be shaped by the environment that it's in. Other organisms can determine whether or not a certain gene is expressed. There are, there are products that are made in uh, coded for by genes that work in the body a certain way, uh, but where the body uses the nutrient is in one organism, and the gene that creates the product is in a different organism. Those are called essential nutrients, right? The things you have to eat. Why do those things exist? Why can't we just get everything we need from our own bodies? We did, probably, when we were, you know, amoebas or something, but it is, it's, it's, the interaction between environment, organisms, and genetics is extremely complicated, goes in all directions, and there isn't that much of a bias on this sort of lower to upper level. I'm going to give you one really quick example of how these complex things can operate, and then we're going to get right back to biases again. You know, imagine a society of humans that hunts, and they hunt something like deer, antelopes, or these wild sheep, and there's also a competing carnivore, in this case, they have a wolf. What humans have done is they reorganized that so that now we have the same elements, but different. There's two kinds of dogs that shepherds use, usually, often. One protects the sheep from the wolves. One herds the sheep using 
built-in tendencies that sheepdogs have and that sheep have that really are from predators and prey originally. The sheep are reacting to a sheepdog like it's a wolf, and they're getting into a group because they do that. The humans riding around on their horses. So in other words, all the elements of a basic system that existed before agriculture are reorganized in this manner. Okay? Um, and that's just true of, of everything. It's true of so many things. This is, this is supposed to be a great cycle of life, and those, those arrows straightened out somehow this morning after I made the slide. Um, <laughs> but it still works. You know, birth and death, those things we're pretty sure about. We know what birth is. We can kind of define it, and we can usually define what death is. But how, and we can sort of measure them. But there's so many other things that are pieced together to make a particular organism or a particular society or a particular biological system operate, some of which I already mentioned. Um, and what, what people are now discovering is that the surface of an organism is achieved by things underneath the surface that are put together in many multiple different combinations of things. For example, animals have two sexes, right? Male and female. The first animal must have had two sexes. And then a species arose, and now you have two species of animals, and they had two sexes. And each one of those may have given rise to other species. So you're getting more and more species of animals. They all have two sexes, right? In order to get two sexes, there must be some process, a gene that says, in a male, do this, in a female, I'll do that, right? And you can actually look inside animals today and figure out some of that stuff, OK? Why is it that there is not a gene that determines sex in all animals? There isn't one. When people start, they, for decades, people figured there was a gene, and they kind of looked for it, but they didn't have the tools. Then they got the tools. They said, ah, now we can find it. And literally, a gazillion dollars went from NIH and NSF money into looking for this X gene. They're still looking. They found it in certain groups of animals, but it's not the same in other groups of animals. Okay? Somehow, evolution has reshaped everything that leads to two sexes so that the reason why you have two sexes is not the same in, 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 in different kinds of animals. Okay? So why is this? Why am I saying all of that? The reason I'm saying all of that is because I really want to convince you that when you look at human behavior and what people are doing, and you try to work out the underlying factors, you can't, because you don't know anything that you need to know to do it. And notice, no one else does either. This is not like scientists have figured out stuff that you just don't know because they didn't tell you. Okay. So when we look at racial, racial bias and racism, or how culture and how minds work in general, we don't really know much about what goes on underneath. So does anyone know the name of the Netflix series about the brothers who were all identical twins who were adopted? What is it? Three identical strangers. Three identical strangers, is that it? Watch it. In the first part of it, you'll be convinced that there's a direct relationship between genetics underlying and behavior on top. You'll be totally convinced. At the end, you'll realize, wait a minute, that was completely made up. It's a very interesting sequence. What is culture? So let's, let's, I want to just talk about culture. What is culture? And if you ask people what culture is, you get interesting answers. Um, some people say it's anything that's not biology. So you've got biology and you've got culture. It's kind of nature, nurture. Okay, that's a really common conception. Okay? Some people will say it's behavior. It's the stuff you do. And that's actually pretty good. I kind of like that one because that's, you know. But does that mean that it applies to like caterpillars? They behave. Do they have culture? Does a rhesus macaque have culture? Does a chimpanzee have culture? You know. Um, I'm not saying they do or not, but just as a question. Uh, is culture things you learn? I like that too, because you're not born with your culture, right? And if you were born with your culture, that would mean that when you took a baby from some other culture and raised it in some other culture, it would keep that culture that it was born with, but it, they don't. Right? So we're not born with it, so it's stuff you learn. Shiny and exotic things, stuff that National Geographic does. That's culture, right? Um, and those are all kinds of things, like if you're a cultural apologist, you must study shiny and exotic things, and so on. Um, but think about it a different way. How does culture work? Um, and I would say that one of the things about culture is what it is, is something that is in mind. It, it exists from your mind. Okay? I would say that it involves multiple minds. Culture doesn't exist in a single person's mind. Okay. Um, it's about things like, like emotion and limbic processes, which are going to be incorporated in culture, but 
That's not so much. Uh, culture is mediated, in my view, and in the view of a growing number of people studying these things, through language and symbolic system. Okay. We think of people as beings with a mind, and also they have language. No, it's really more like language is what makes us human. If we just broaden the definition of language, it okay. Or we can think of ourselves as Terry Deacon has defined. He's a, a mind scientist. Uh, we just work. We just work. He so, so said he's saying he, he identifies human as a symbolic species. We operate like we operate because we exchange symbols. Okay. Just to be clear, a symbol is not a thing that looks like something. A symbol is something that is utterly arbitrary in what it looks like, like or sounds like, like, but we agree means a certain thing. So a symbol is a thing with meaning that normally we agree on what the meaning is. And, and we are exchanging meaning and making meaning and so on by exchanging symbolic information. Um, we know that culture fails to form an isolation. This goes back to the views not born today. We know that full functioning language tends to not form an isolation. There's not a, a lot of data, but there are wild child cases and there are people who grow up without that. Not access, did not access the language, and they kind of get, get the, the ability to communicate, communicate, but there's evidence that they don't have fully formed language, even though they're people. So just like a chimpanzee can be kind of linguistic if they're raised among people talking with them all the time, from the time they're born, humans who aren't don't get there, chimpanzees who are don't get there either. Okay? Um, it's obviously adapted to context, and that's a huge part of why we study culture. It's adapted. It's adaptive. And I'm going to demonstrate sort of why that's true in a moment. Um, and it also replicates itself. Now, you all know Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, and his idea that memes of memes. Unfortunately, memes have ruined our, our thinking on this a little bit. A meme is, of course, now it's a, it's a thing you put on Facebook. Um, and it's a picture of some guy saying one does not walk into mortar or something. But R Dawkins' original idea was that it's this thing, a piece of information that is so good at being passed on, at replicating itself, that it just spreads and takes over. So like religion is a meme. Like we can't explain why would you have religion. Well, it takes its care of itself. Okay. But, that, but then that extends the idea of it's pretty random and irrelevant and non-adaptive. But I'm going to not agree to that. I think that culture is, can be highly adaptive. And, and it is still passed on. And meme, the meme concept is an oversimplification. Um, and also, and this is really important, this is the most important thing that lets us understand racial biases. This process of symbolic communication and thinking is a thing that exists that works a certain way. It isn't just, it, 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 it is subject of worthy of study and it helps us understand ourselves. So I'm gonna give you a radical idea here. And this is based largely on the work of Terrence Deacon and some other people. This is obviously Sherlock Holmes, and he didn't exist. But Arthur Conan Doyle did, and he actually read a lot of relevant philosophy, so he may have actually had some of this stuff seep in. Uh, Holmes is known to say, data, data, I can't make bricks without clay. And in many, many, many cases, you can look up like Holmes quotes. He doesn't, he'll tell you, you can't, I can't solve the crime until I have all of the information. I need all of the information. I won't even think about it. And I have all the information, then I will solve the crime. Okay? That is not the scientific method. Scientists don't work. The scientists make an observation. They don't understand. They make a hypothesis. They test it. And now they know a little bit more than they knew. Then they make some more observations. Along the way, they have other observations. They test. The, they make more hypotheses. They test those. Scientists start with nothing. And they work on it. And they keep thinking of ideas. Idea, 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 idea. So finally, they got something solid. They don't sit there and say, I'm not going to think until I know everything, until I know all the facts. They don't do that. No scientist has ever done that. Okay? Holmes insists it's the only way to do it. Okay, Bacon would say, use the hypothetical deductive method. Holmes would say, don't. Which one's right? Well, they're both right. Bacon's right if you want to do science. Holmes' right is right if you're just a person. Okay, what, what um, a philosopher by the name of Charles Sanders Peirce came up with this concept. And subsequent philosophers, and just so you know, it isn't just me, some guy up here talking, Umberto Eco and some other famous people you've heard of and read are in on this idea that this is a way of inferring things that is not what you learn in your critical thinking discussion. It's a different way of inferring things that you don't know about unless you happen to have read this particular set of philosophy. 
So it just happened that last night I was at the um, uh, building at the university, the, the big student center. And I parked there. And while I parked there, I remembered something. I remembered parking there many years ago, back when we all were working at Ford Hall, remember? And I parked in that, in that building in my blue 740 Volvo in the afternoon, went into work, came back late at night, and it was the only car there. It was my Volvo. I walked over to it, and as I'm walking to it, I'm thinking, it looks cleaner than it was. I wonder if my wife like, took it and cleaned it and parked it in the same exact spot. Nah. I got closer, and I noticed that the car seat in the back was not only cleaner, but different. I thought, why is my car seat different? And I'm looking, oh, some stuff is, what's that, in the car, what's that on this chair over there? And I'm trying the key, and the key's not working. Okay? At no point did I think, this is the wrong car. The car was in the floor down below. How many 740 blue bubbles are in Minnesota? None, because it's stupid to drive one here. There's too much ice. Okay, I, I didn't buy it here, right? So, but my brain would not let me realize how wrong I was. You've heard this. Socrates speaks. Socrates has two legs. And you jump in and say, well, Socrates is a man. Well, actually, Socrates is a parrot. You got it wrong. The way that Holmes solves problems is he catalogs every crime that he can find out about. He puts them in his brain. He has only room for those crimes. He won't know things. He will refuse to learn facts like the earth goes around the sun, right? This is in the literature. So he has all the crimes in his brain. He observes a crime. He finds a fact about a crime, another fact, another fact, and he matches them with his catalog of facts of prior, prior crimes until he's got a couple of crimes that match best with what he observes. And then he forms his hypothesis. He tricks the bad guy to walk into a room. And if the bad guy goes for the, for, to, for the, for the um, Victrola versus the closet, then he knows he did it. Because he's got a hypothesis filling in the last blank on his crime. Okay? That's the Holmesian method. Matching patterns. Matching patterns. Okay? Attributes. Not hypothetical deductive reasoning, not trial and error, not hypothesis formation, not formal logic, just matching patterns. Okay? And matching patterns, according to Peirce, and I think this is a good theory, is how we go from not knowing something to going, knowing something. And as infants and children, and as we get older, we continue to match patterns to learn what is normal for us. Okay? And and we behave in that way. And patterns are things you observe on the outside of your world or that jiggle you or touch you or tickle you or affect you when you're going through life bumping into ideas and things and people and circumstances. When I do that, it hurts. I do that, it feels good. Simple. Okay, then more complex things. Okay. Um, we are not only match patterns, but this idea is that we are sensitive to patterns and we communicate in patterns. And it turns out that there's some good linguistic theory about that too. Everything we do in our minds is some sort of metaphorical act. Metaphors, what are they? They're patterns that we use to understand things. Okay. So I know this is a long way, it sounds like a long way from racial bias, but it's not. My argument is that race bias is people doing a good job at what they're good at at picking up the patterns that are around us and transmitting them to other people, usually younger people, and making them work, okay? And this becomes very important. If, never mind the car down there, just to remind me to talk about the car analogy I used before, which I already said. The theory here, the idea here is that if, every, if all you have is a hammer, you'll treat everything like a nail. If abductive reasoning, this pattern matching, is your main normal brain process, that's how you will treat everything ultimately. It was Teller who said, I don't use the scientific method unless I can't think of anything. Okay, scientists using the scientific method are using pattern matching and this kind of behavior. And now, here's the key to all of it. The key to it is childhood. Okay, um, that of the upper left-hand picture is, is just, a, a, it's actually the front cover of a book written many years ago by Mel Conner called Childhood. Great read. And this is some, I just randomly picked this data showing mortality rates of um, uh, maternal and infant mortality, okay? If you were an alien from another planet, you came here and right now, you look at this, you go, what the hell is that? You have infant mortality? Your females die in childbirth, earthling? That's ridiculous. Of all of the things you do, wouldn't evolution have shaped childbirth to be relatively successful 
and maybe even painless, or at least doesn't break you all the time. Now, you might be thinking, well, childbirth, people get sick of childbirth because of modern medicine screwing up. No, no, no. We can look at culture after culture after culture, and childbirth is dangerous, always. We are the only species on this earth that gives birth that does so, except for salmon and so on, which die on purpose, but except for our domestic animals. We die in childbirth because we have culture. Right? This is basic... You learn this in school, you're just not putting it together necessarily the way that it's normally done. We'll come back to it in a moment. This is a study done years ago, one of the few studies that did this, that looked at the um, IQ of children under five. It turns out that IQ experts like to measure kids' IQ. It's more stable numerically until they're, when they're old people and kids, the best, most stable numbers. And they found the persistent 15-point difference in IQ between white and black children. Then they studied socioeconomic status and home environments effects on IQ and basically erased the difference. Children under five, okay? So the, 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 the achievement gap in high school caused by all these biases was already there and caused by their environment. There's a falsehood that we have that earlier things earlier in life are more genetic and things later in life are more cultural or changed by circumstances. This is a good example of, if that's true, it's only the first few days of life, okay? Um, the ultimate experiment to test this idea would be to get a bunch of children of quote unquote different races. And I didn't mention earlier, but the whole race concept, you know, is, is invalid. Like there aren't actual biological races in people, but that would be another, another hour. Um, isolate them from their parents, get a group of people who are, um, ideologically and professionally committed to raising them all in a way that is non-biased and then testing their IQ. And according to the race-based model that we have these racial differences, you would expect white parents to have an IQ, kids with white parents to have an IQ about 105, black parents 85, and mixed parents about 95. That's a prediction based upon all the science that talks about race. What you actually get, this actually happened, it was a British orphanage, and they actually did this. And there's the samples they did, three tests, with, the, and there were like hundreds of kids in this test. There's no statistical difference between any of those numbers, okay? There's no racially determined difference in IQ, okay? Um, I wanna go back to this a little bit and just point out, see, I thought I had another slide here after this one, but I didn't. You might have noticed a little skip I did there. We die in childbirth because we have large brains and we are bipedal. We got bipedalism first, did that for a few million years, then added the large brain, and that's what causes complications in childbirth, okay? We didn't have to do that. That brain could have gotten smaller again. Like if all the women who are giving birth to large brain babies are dying at a higher rate, you would expect selection to get rid of that problem. When people, when biologists ask, is that an adaptation for any particular feature? One of the questions they ask is, is there a cost? This is a costly. Having a large brain is costly, not just because of childbirth, but because brains are, you know, when you die of hypothermia, you're dying of a large brain. Your body's shutting down all the systems to keep your brain stable, okay? Um, large brains kill us. Thanks, big brain, as Kurt Vonnegut said in that one book. Um, so it's obviously there for some reason, and what it's there for is culture. It's the place where culture lives and exists, okay? So if you look at the life history patterns of chimpanzees next to human beings, for example, you'll see that between the age of birth and adolescence, the equivalent of adolescence, there's about an extra five years of time in the human, human uh, life history pattern. That's a time during which the brain is doing its most of its growth, and that's a time in which language is being picked up and learned. That's a time in which people are getting their kinships, relationships ready together, that's the time that they're going from being a helpless, senseless infant. And by the way, chimpanzees are not helpless and senseless. They can cling to the mother and they can like be left alone. Baby, human babies can't, right? Humans are suicidal through toddlership, right? Constantly, constantly trying to kill themselves. And demanding parental attention and huge amounts of parental investment, okay? And their brains are growing and growing. They're absorbing culture. They're becoming a cultural being, okay? And everything that happens to them at that point in time that tells them about race, about racial behavior, about racialized behavior, about how to treat other people, 
It's all happening during that entire period of time. Okay. Um, childhood is, is the answer. Now, sorry, I have to just skip past all these. There's no way to go past it faster. Um, just quickly, racism, I already mentioned, is not normal and found in all societies. The in-group, out-group behavior um, is not built in. These are falsehoods. And American racism is typical. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned those things I already did. So how to solve the problem? Very easy. This is my last slide. How to solve the problem? First thing you do is, there's a famous experiment done by a pharaoh many years ago, in which he wanted to know about the origins of language. So what he did was he got several hundred children separated at birth from their parents, and then had them nursed by, by priests in a temple, and no one was allowed to speak. The children started to babble, and the first thing that anyone said, any child said that was recognized as a word in their language, the word that sounded something like biblos or biblos, something like that, which is also a site. Um, and that happened to be the ancient Egyptian word for wheat. So the pharaoh now understood that the first primordial concept and word in our language is wheat. Now, of course, this is probably a made-up story, but even if it wasn't, the pharaoh was you know, crazy. But that's one way to solve racism, right? It's just like solving all those disgusting things kids do, like open their mouth and they're eating. If you could just keep kids away from each other, away from other people for like 15 years, they would just be different, right? So one way to do it is basically keep people, just, just new society from the start, rebuild it. Can't do that. Integration, as Kamala Harris's mark, remarks were. Integration, okay? We need to have a situation in which we don't have all white teachers. We need to have a situation where we don't have all white neighborhoods and all black neighborhoods, okay? And where those things happen, things get better. And you can experiment right now. You can find out how well integration works by traveling around the world and finding all those other places in the world where that's how people live and have been living for generations. You'll hear multiple languages. You'll see people fighting and being mean to each other, but they're not being racist assholes. Okay? It's an American thing, and some other people do it, because in part we have, it's facilitated by the legacy of slavery combined with the legacy of separation. Okay? The other way is to shut the fuck up. Now, Trump took the lid off, but really saying racist things and passing on racist ideas isn't good and not nice, and you're not supposed to do it, everybody knows that. Oh, there's an awful lot of people out there in this world, in this country, who know to keep their mouth shut because their spouses or their children, someone will tell them to shut up. And unfortunately, we're regressing on that. We've just gone back 50 years in that in the last few years, okay? But one way to stop racism is to take the people who are gonna perpetuate racism and stop them specifically from being allowed to do that, okay? With social norms making it normal to not to do this, okay? And the other way to do it is to not shut up. When racial, uh, racialized biases exist, don't give it a stern look. Don't go tisk tisk. Don't tell someone else how annoying that is. You confront it directly. I mean, not everybody can confront everything directly all the time. You can do something. There's safe things you can do. And there's less safe things you can do. Be brave, but not stupid. Okay, and then finally, time. If you do all those things, um, it used to be worse. And it isn't quite as bad now. So that's, that's what I've got for you.